you are alive, you are alive. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Here you find us walking through the wilderness on a blustery day, 23 degrees Fahrenheit. No, that's not true at all. I'd be in a lot bigger jacket than I am now. 23 degrees centigrade, 73 degrees Fahrenheit. Wild Earth TV is the who you're with and this is called Safari Live. And if you have stumbled across this website for the first time and are wondering what on earth I'm doing traipsing through the wilds of Africa alone and seemingly in the barren wilderness, fear not. You're about to come on a little adventure with us. We're on foot in the magnificence of the northeastern corner of South Africa, the Kruger National Park and the western fringes thereof. This is a very live, at the moment, only walking safari. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have got Brian, the giraffe Joubert, and back in the final control, Tara Dales twiddling the knobs and Louise Pavard tweeting the tweets. Hashtag Safari Live if you'd like to talk to us, and please do talk to us, especially if you're perhaps a new viewer and questions at wildearth.tv if the technology of tweeting like a blue jay is a little bit beyond you. It's certainly sometimes very much beyond me. Now, we normally have uh, two safari vehicles out and a walk at the moment. Couple of issues with the cars. Uh, Wendy, unfortunately, uh, who was fixed today, uh, broke again this afternoon. So we're going to just take you on a leisurely stroll through the bush for now and see how long we can maintain our signal. I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. So we're going to find lots of little things for you to look at and marvel at. And if we find one or two bigger things, well, that's even better. Now, before we move, let's just have a look around at the sky, which is filled with very grey, very beautiful clouds. You can see we had a lot of wonderful rain this morning and what that meant unfortunately was that we couldn't take a safari because the camera equipment and batteries generally uh, don't like to be covered in water. Uh, we're not very good at boating out at Wild Earth at the moment and so because of the wetness we took a little sort of, um, because of the wetness, we did a little talk this morning and now we're out in the bush. We don't know if these clouds are going to bring rain anymore. Every so often a big grey one rolls in from either from, it's normally actually from the south and from the northeast today. This is a cyclone system off Mozambique and so it is bringing rain with it. It's slightly distinct from the uh, sort of normal frontal weather that we come coming through here. So big grey laden clouds beautiful kind of rolling, rolling thunderous clouds coming overhead and I just find it the most enthralling kind of atmosphere. So let's go for a walk, see what we can see and if you want to ask us a question please do so. If you want to comment on anything at all, hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv. Good. I was told recently that um, I was given this, this little stick here by Brent Leo Smith a little while back and I was told recently that I was swinging it around like Harry Potter so I'm going to be a lot more uh, circumspect about its use today and the first thing I'm going to point at with my stick actually is a butterfly beautiful minty colored butterfly I've been studying up my butterflies but that one I knew already there's another one there Brian on the ground let's just walk slowly here beautiful minty green but butterfly there can you see him it's just on the grass there. There are a few of them here. You got him? Okay. You can see him with your eyes. So that is called an African migrant. Not. No. Okay. Come a little bit closer. We'll. I'll try and. There are quite a few of them flitting about here. And just lovely shining colours. There you got him. Lovely colours shining in the sun and he's feeding on a flower. Now of course butterflies, much like or unlike their, um, their caterpillar larvae, tend to feed a lot on flower nectar and pollen rather than on leaf material. So the larvae or caterpillars eat a lot of leaves and the butterflies have those long proboscises. What is the plural of proboscis? Probosci. Uh, that's a long kind of snout that they stick into the flowers and drink out the nectar. Lovely butterfly. I just got it now. You got him. Well done. 
Okay, now he's sucking little bits of nectar out of an ore of sort of purplish flower that I think is probably a saffron, a wild saffron. Mm. So here's the flower that he was supping upon and it looks to be a wild saffron. I think let's just have a smell. I smelt one of these with you yesterday. Delightful smelling thing. Mm. And I was asked if they're used for cooking at all, which of course uh, I don't think they are. They've got it's it's just a bit too strong, don't you think, Brian? I wouldn't I wouldn't use one of these for cooking. It kind of um, I think it would leave a slightly oily film on whatever you were cooking, unless you dried it very carefully, and it's probably a little bit stronger than uh, the normal sage saffron. Sorry. Right. Here we go. Let us keep our ex exploring across this clearing. Now, we are being observed. You may not be able to feel it, but we are certainly being observed just from over there by some impala. And a few of them have spotted us, and a few of them have yet to kind of look up. So it's a big herd, a nursery herd of impala of many, many ewes that are going to drop their lambs, hopefully, by the end of November. And some of them have seen us, and some of them haven't, and the ones that have are a little bit weary. You'll find that impala are very wary of all things that could be predators, but at the same time they're not exactly running away, so that's rather nice. And that's mainly because they can see us from a good distance, and they were certainly nowhere near to being within their flight distance. Uh, for those of you who perhaps don't know, let's get a little bit closer. For those of you who perhaps don't know, a fight or flight distance is the distance at which an animal decides, um, it's a line. It's a line beyond which, an an if you get into that animal space and it can't move away from you, it will then fight you. And if you are before that line and the animal feels threatened, it will eventually just run away. So, you have the flight line and you have the fight line. And we would never get within the fight line of these animals because they would never be cornered by us. They'd move away from us long before that happened. So let's see how close we can get. I'm not sure if you can pick up the distance or not, but Brian, I'd say we're what? Say 150 meters? Your focus might actually tell you. No. Yeah, okay. So we'll measure the distance quickly. I'm going to guess at roughly 150 meters. Yeah, Not 150 meters, so in feet, if you multiply that by 3.3, we're looking at roughly eh, 450, say 550 feet, plus minus. Okay, so let's go a little bit closer. Let's see at what stage they're going to move away. And I believe there's an elephant Juma waterhole, which isn't too far from here. So what we'll do is we'll just investigate these impala first, and then we'll head down there. I know our signal isn't great, so he might head up towards where we are now. So we'll head sort of down towards that area. So we've closed the distance now to about 125 meters. And still they're not running. They might sort of start to move away fairly soon. There we go. One of them's showing a little bit of interest in us. And what they'll start to do also is demonstrate how fit they are. Now what you find with a lot of these uh, antelope is that when they feel threatened, especially with wild dogs I find, they start to prance around and that pronking kind of stotting behavior that they do. Pronking is what springbok do, stotting is what impala do. When they run along and they kick their back legs out, is a, is a way of showing fitness, saying, look how fast I am, look how strong I am, don't go for me, rather go for my friend who's been tucking into the takeout. So you can see we're now within a hundred meters of them. They're certainly not panicked in any shape, way or form. But they'll start to start, they'll start to pay a little bit more attention to us now as we move a little bit closer. Also, because they can see us coming, it makes a huge difference. So we're not behaving like predators at all. 
predators wouldn't just walk straight up to them in a clearing like this. Predators would uh, sneak behind a tree, if, and if we suddenly ducked behind the tree like that, I think they'd react a lot worse than they are now. Big herd of impala. We probably caused them to coalesce slightly. Now you can see them moving away. So we're, we're within about 100 meters. I think we've probably reached almost the flight line. I think you'd find probably at about 80 meters uh, they'd, they'd run away. Right, we're going to take it, we're going to walk another 20 meters closer and then we're going to veer off towards the Juma waterhole and see if we can't see that elephant. So if you are, um, well, you probably are watching the Juma Dam cam, please keep an eye on the elephant and see where he goes. Not sure how good our signal will be down there, but we'll make an attempt to go down there and see what we can see. So 20, min 20 meters closer, we've now gone 10 meters closer, so we're probably about 90 meters from them. And you can see them, they're not that comfortable with us within this distance. And there they go. Just starting to move off now as we close that distance. There we go, that's it. Although some of them are being quite brave. There it is. Okay, so I think that's probably, yeah, I'd say 80, 80 to 100 meters. Good, so that's a nice discovery for the afternoon. We're now going to veer in a due easterly direction and let's go and see if we can spot an elephant. An elephant on foot, of course, is a primal, primal experience. Follow me. Watch the, watch the thorns there, everybody. Don't scratch your legs. Brian, of course, is covered in a number of uh, very important accoutrements to his, the bottom of his fairly substantial legs. And that is, <laughs> that is because there are a lot of thorns out here, and he is not able to look where he's going while he's fo following me with the camera. And so he has substantial protection on his legs. Andrew doesn't wear the same thing, with the, um, with the effect that Andrew's legs now look like something out of a... Um, well, off a battlefield, really. But he's okay. He's a tough fellow. So we'll walk relatively quickly. I don't want to give, take too... We don't want to give them too much time to finish and go away. Apparently there are two elephants there. So let's walk a little bit faster. Now, while we're walking along here, it's a little bit like driving quickly to a sighting. Now, we can talk about lots of different things. And Matty, you say you watch the Juma Dam cam all the way from the Netherlands. And that's a good place to be watching the Juma Dam cam from. Um, and you say you've seen a rhino on it, and why don't we show them on the main show? Matty, um, it's because of the scourge of rhino poaching, uh, which isn't too bad in this area. But we don't want to do anything that might, could possibly, in any way, affect the increase of rhino poaching. And obviously, people know where we are. It's easy to log on to this website. Probably quite difficult to find a rhino if we found it. But we don't want to do anything to increase it. And if there was even the remotest, tiniest chance that a potential poacher... Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for that, uh, Brian. <laughs> This is my ash bag, everyone, to check the direction of the wind. It's actually not mine, it's Scott Dyson, so I'm lucky I didn't lose it. Um, so, Matty, the whole thing is that sh if there was ever a chance that a potential poacher might watch, maybe, and I think it's highly unlikely, but if there was ever a chance, we just don't want to give anybody, you know, the chance to see a rhino if they might have ill designs on it. So that's why we don't look at them. Like I've said before, in this particular area, rhino poaching is almost at a standstill. Um, and that's because the private landowners of this area, you now we're on a private section of the western parts of the Kruger National Park. And because it's private, people do put in 
a lot of private money into protection and because of that they have managed to almost stop rhino poaching in this area completely which is marvelous. The Kruger is a lot more difficult because it's enormous. Three and a half million acre hectares if you include Gonera Zoo in Zimbabwe or, uh, and the Greater Limpopo National Park in Mozambique, three and a half million hectares, eight million acres, hugely difficult to try and protect a piece of land that size. And so, yeah, I mean, they're still struggling really quite a lot with rhino poaching. I think they will eventually get on top of it. The numbers, while they've increased over the last few years, I think this year they managed to plateau. So I think with any luck, this year might see the first time that the war on rhino poaching uh, will probably gain some momentum, which is excellent news. And it's an extremely complicated problem. It's not simply a fact of anti-poaching. It's a fact of uh, poverty, extreme poverty. It's a fact of um, cultural beliefs embedded for thousands of years in the Far East. That's definitely where most of the rhino horn is going. There is no, interestingly, no traditional use for rhino horn in this area at all. So the Shangan people on both sides of the border, remember that the Kruger National Park is on the Mozambican border. And most of the poaching forays are coming in from the Mozambican side where there's very little kind of policing. It's extremely rural, not so much from the South African side. But poor people on both sides, destitute, desperate, no employment, really unpredictable climate, so difficult to grow your own food and that sort of thing. So it's really, it's a complicated problem with a lot multifaceted approach to solving. And I know that there, that I can never remember his name, that famous Chinese um, basketball player, he and a whole lot of other people have done a huge amount to try and change cultural norms in China and at the same time there are people here involved in security, people here involved in education, people here involved in tourism and tourism of course is the great saviour of areas like this because without tourism these areas couldn't pay for themselves and they couldn't employ the incredible number of people that they do. So the Sabi Sands which is 60,000 hectares and if we might by that by 2.2 we get to roughly 2.4 sorry we we'll get to almost sort of uh, 200,000 hectares acres blah, 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 200,000 acres and that 200,000 acres employs about two and a half thousand people two and a half thousand people now they in turn each support guess how many people are supported by one job in the Sabi Sands job in the Sabi Sands. So you can see what tourism is doing for this area is quite serious. Maybe there, there, there's an odd naysayer who says that well you know should think things should be wild and be allowed into them and that sort of thing. The tourism out here is doing more for conservation at the moment than anything else because it's winning the hearts and minds of people outside the fence and that is a massively massively important part of tourism here. Now we're just round the corner, so we're going to be a little bit careful about towards Okay, now, while we're approaching, we're going to try and find the best approach, check the wind, check the safety, and make sure that we are very comfortable. We're going to send you over to the Juma Dam Cam, we'll play that over the stream, and we'll get a bit closer on foot and hopefully see you there in a few minutes. Thank you. 
I'd say about 400 meters away. Uh, he didn't be so bright just because he was in the woods and he was also carrying a backpack on his back. Should we go? Let's come up the tree here.
side of the dam here. And you can see the elephants are still fiddling about there. I can't see exactly what they're doing. So we've repositioned, we've come around the side of the dam and they're still not reacting to us. They've definitely seen us, they know that we are here. But because they're two young bulls, they're not threatened. Well, they're not that young. I mean, they're probably about 25 years each. Two beautiful bulls, almost in their prime. They don't feel threatened by us because we're a good distance. We're probably about 150 to 200 meters from them. Now, what they're doing, Velma, you say that you've seen them eating dirt and could there possibly be a benefit to this? Absolutely there is. You know, this time of year it is dry, so there's not a lot in the way of nutrients coming out of the grass, coming out of the soil into the grass. I had lovely rain in the last day, so that will change soon. But until the grass comes up, holding all the beautiful nutrients that are in the soil, they will eat dirt in order to get salts that they lack from the vegetation that they eat. So Velma, absolutely there's a great use to eating dirt and I think that's precisely what they're doing there on the edge of the pan because there's no, there's no water there and there's certainly nothing in the way of delicious vegetation. Probably sodium, possibly a little bit of phosphorus and potassium that they're looking for in the soil. It's called geophagia, which means the eating of, basically eating of the earth. Then, you saw Kevin, you witnessed them 
when they were greeting each other, putting their trunks in each other's mouths. Now that's very common with elephants. It's just a greeting. It's a, it, we see it often with calves and members of a herd who are sort of socially bonding with each other. And these bulls are clearly just bonding. And that's exactly how they do it. They put their trunks in each other's mouths and then put the trunk back in their own mouths. And I think what that does is uh, it gives a sense of smell, absolutely. And they've got a very strong olfactory sense. Um, and there's an organ that most animals have, including many reptiles, that we've, we've got it, but it's vestigial. It doesn't really function in our bodies. It's called the organ, organ of J Jacobson, or the vemoronasal organ. And what it will do is interpret pheromone signals. So what they will get is pheromone signals from the mouth, put them into their own mouths, Impala. I just heard some Impala alarm calling and I think they're probably alarm called because they saw us standing here. <laughs> Got to be aware when you're out here. You can't be yakking along too loudly. Um, so you can see the... So let's quickly... I believe there's some wonderful pictures of the prehensile tip coming off the Juma Dam cam. Well done, Zumi, whoever Zumi is in charge. Let's go back there and I'll talk you through that prehensile tip. Now, pre prehensile means that it's like a hand. So if you think of your hands, uh, you've got a, a, an opposable thumb. Well, you should have an opposable thumb unless you're a chimpanzee in which case you have opposable feet as well. But most of us have opposable thumbs and what that allows us to do is pick things up. Now that, that, prehensile, <laughs> that prehensile tip of the trunk allows the elephant to pick up the most astonishingly tiny little pieces of vegetation and fruit and you watch them during the marula season and then it's the most obvious. They pick up individual marula fruits and pop them in their mouths selecting the best sort of smelling ones and tasting ones. So very interesting that. So just to get back to the, the greeting and Kevin's question, very important part of all animals greetings out here is that sensing and smelling of pheromones. And I find it a fascinating thing because we all know when somebody around us smells like home, they smell familiar to you. And it's got very little to do with um, nice or unpleasant or it's, there's no judgment of good or bad on it, it just smells like home, it smells right, if you know what I mean. And there are certain people that are unrelated to you that will just smell right to you. And I think it's a similar kind of thing that they are sensing uh, when they put the trunks into the other elephant's mouth, they get a sense of the smell, they put it up into their own mouths, into that vemoronasal organ which sits just above the nasal passage and quite close to the brain. And that interprets is this smell like home? Does this smell familiar to me? Or does it not? And it's quite an interesting thing, I think. And it, I think that we humans are much more sensitive to it than we think we are. Let's go a little bit closer. We'll just try and stand possibly where that um, bunch of dead trees is and we'll just get another quick look. If the signal does break up, we'll come straight back to where we are here. It's just a wonderful thing when they are so confiding. So. We're standing out here in the open. We're not trying to hide at all. We're not trying to get behind a piece of cover or bush. And that's because I know that they know we are here. And it's important that we then don't start to behave like predators. They're perfectly comfortable with us at this distance. Um, I think it's also because they're not smelling us. The wind is blowing basically from the left-hand side of your screen off towards the right. So they won't be picking up our scent. And again, that olfactory sense of smell is such a hugely important thing for them. I think were the wind to switch around to them, I think while they certainly wouldn't come chasing after us, they may become slightly more uncomfortable because of the smell of human being. It tends to unsettle animals anywhere in the world. This is very special, I must say. Oops. There we go, we're in a very nice position now. And the other elephant you can't see, he's disappeared down behind the dam. But this fellow is now eating, seems to be, is he still eating dirt? I can't actually tell. Anyway, today we had lots of rain. There he's 
picking up little bits of very, very kind of herby, but like that sage is that bush that he's eating there. So it'll be quite strong, quite rich. And Mike, you've obviously noticed that it was raining today, and you want to know if that affects the elephant's behavior at all. Um, I think the cooler weather probably allows them to move more than they would during the heat of the day, on a very warm day. Um, yeah, so they probably do move a little bit more maybe during a rainy day than they would during a hot day, when they would move more during sort of crepuscularly, so during sunrise and sunset. So possibly. I don't think there's an enormous difference. You'll probably find there's a slight difference. But uh, elephants, you notice, don't have hair other than for on the tips of their tails and on the sort of top of their foreheads, uh, especially as babies, they don't have any hair on them and there's a very good reason for that. And the reason for that, of course, is heat loss. And you find the bigger the, an animal is out here, the less hair it has. That, of course, doesn't apply to human beings. I have got uh, far less hair on my head than Brian, for example, and Brian is much larger than I. It applies in terms larger the animal is, the less hair it has. And that's because the bigger you are, I'm just going to back off a little bit, our signal is not great. Should we just go around here, Brian, to see if we can. Um, all that means is the bigger you are, the more you, easy it is for you to lose heat. The more easy it is also for you, sorry, not to lose heat, the more difficult it is for you to gain heat but at the same time, you will maintain heat. So when it is very hot, if you're a huge animal like an elephant, you need to have a fairly sophisticated cooling mechanism, and you don't want any kind of insulation that's going to keep the heat in your body. So that's why they don't have any hair. And that's why small things, like rodents out here, will always have hair on them, because as soon as the temperature drops, they lose heat very fast. They heat up very quickly, but they also lose heat very fast. And that's got to do with a principle called the surface area to body mass ratio. And basically what that means is the larger you are, and let me just get this right in my mind, the larger you are, the larger, sorry, the smaller your surface area to body mass ratio is. And all that means is, uh, let's not go into the details, all that means is that the bigger you are, the more difficult it is for you to lose heat, but at the same time, the less cold you're going to get when the temperature, ambient temperature drops. I think it's quite fascinating. And that really does affect the physiological rate or the metabolic rate of various animals. So the metabolic rate of an elephant, for, exa for example, um, while it uses much more energy than an elephant shrew, which is a tiny little uh, rodent-like animal, it isn't a rodent, but it's like a rodent. And because, obviously, an elephant uses a lot more energy, but Per gram of body mass, an elephant shrew uses exponentially more um, energy than a gram of elephant does, and that's because of that uh, size and surface area to body mass ratio. Right, shall we try and sneak a little bit round, perhaps? He is having a drink. and they're very valid. We're just going to try and move a little bit closer down here. If the signal does break, we'll go back to where we were. Pamela and Valerie, you ask very valid queries about safety. Not afraid? No. Let's go back again. Um, Okay, here. So, Valerie and P Pamela, good question about are we not afraid that he might charge us? So, and what would we do if he did and if he came closer, what would our reaction be? Um, the crucial thing here is that we're not afraid. We're definitely very weary, though. 
so I'm most aware of how he's reacted to us. I know that that elephant saw us from way back when we were on the way the other side there. He saw us. And once he'd seen us, I made sure that he could see us when we walked around. We came across the drainage line, we came through the bushes here, and we came down here. And it was very important that he did see us because we're not behaving like predators. Now, if he had reacted to us uh, when we were on the termite mound way at the other side, if he turned around and shook his head at us like that and taken a few steps forward, I'd have been a lot more wary about coming anywhere near him. We probably would have stayed there, waited for him to relax and maybe tried one or two other positions. Again, not hiding from him. I think the chances of that elephant turning and coming herring across this drainage line at us now are almost zero. And so I'm very comfortable standing here. He's not looking at us. He's definitely aware that we're here. And he's probably glancing over his shoulder every so often just to check that we aren't doing anything nefarious. But you can see him blowing water there. As, he, as he's blowing water, he's just, he's relaxed. He's, he's not worried about us in the slightest. Now, were he to turn around and start walking towards us, there are certainly, there are certainly times when you might just sit. So there are places in Zimbabwe, mana pools, you can sit under a tree and the old elephant bulls, they're so used to people, they'll come right up to you, they won't even pay any, any attention to you. Kruger, it's not the same. I wouldn't let that elephant get too close to us. If he started to walk towards us, we'd just melt quietly into the bush. I wouldn't wait for him to get close. I wouldn't wait for him to get close enough to decide whether or not he liked us or not. He wouldn't have that choice. So if he turned and came towards us, we'd just slowly disappear off into the bush and totally reduce any potential for conflict. And that's a big thing. For our philosophy of how we do things here is to reduce any kind of animal conflict. We're not here to threaten that animal. We're here to view him in his natural habitat and to view him in his most natural state. And that is without being threatened by human beings. So if he was to come towards us, we just melt quietly off into the bush there. And then their eyesight. Gail, you've asked about their eyesight. And I think a lot of people ask about elephant eyesight. And you're in London. And, sorry, Daryl, not Gail. <laughs> Hello, Daryl in London. Lovely to hear from you. It, their eyesight's very good. It's just like ours, I think. Um, you, some, there were times when people thought their eyesight wasn't quite as good as ours, but I definitely think it's at least as good as ours, and possibly even better, especially in the night time. And I think the reason that people thought that perhaps their eyesight isn't as good as ours is because they don't react when they see us often. Often they only react when they smell us or they hear us. Mainly when they smell us. So he knows we're here. I'm telling you now, if the wind was to swap around and blow straight towards him, he'd definitely turn on and look because that smell makes him react in a certain way. And it's exactly the same as when you are, say you, you get into a lift one day and you're going up in a lift and somebody gets in and they've had, they're perhaps wearing the perfume of your first girlfriend or the perfume of your first, uh, of your grandmother. That will immediately bring up all sorts of memories in your head. Now, it's the same thing with that elephant. That smell will immediately conjure up whatever threat it feels from human beings. There's no question that an elephant feels a threat from a human being, but because we're not close enough, it's not going to react to us. So Daryl, he can definitely see us, there's absolutely no question. But he's not reacting to us because he doesn't feel threatened by us. Now what a privilege this is. Now we were talking a little bit earlier about poaching and Kristen in Savannah, Georgia, you want to know if I've ever been involved in a sort of rescue situation with elephants, baby elephants or adults that have been caught in snares or wires. Kristen, I haven't. I've been involved in, in helping uh, a couple of other kinds of animals, uh, buffalo and lions, but never elephants. And that's often, Kristen, because elephants are strong and so they break the wires often that uh, try and catch them. But in this area as well, I mean, I haven't ever done it in this particular area. Up further north of here, where there's not so much protection, I've had a little bit more involvement in it. But I haven't done a huge amount of anti-poaching work. That will be anti-poaching work. And I have, unfortunately, often come across in some... 
I have come across quite a few buffalo carcasses that have been caught and then taken away by the poachers. So no, not with elephants and I've certainly actually never come across an elephant in this particular area that has been caught by a snare which is wonderful. It does happen, it's a very sad thing when it does happen, uh, but in this particular area we're pretty we're pretty safe without those snares, so that's very good. There's lots of protection for the animals here. So he's now drinking his water. Um, that cracking noise, I don't know if you heard it, would have been a, a, is it the other elephant. and He's gone down behind the damn wall there and he's now breaking trees and trying to get bits and pieces to eat from them. And if I thought we'd get any signal there, I might suggest we walked onto the damn wall to have a look. But I don't think that we're going to get any signal up top there, I'm afraid. Anyway, Gilly in Wisconsin, you've asked me one of the unanswerable queries and um, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to accept your question because I find it very fascinating. You say that I've told you, or maybe Wild Earth has told you, that elephants are related to whales in some way, way back in history, in evolutionary history. Um, it certainly wasn't me that told you that. I've never heard that, but I think it sounds fascinating. And so if anyone can confirm or deny that, that would be marvellous. And then you say perhaps, and are rhinos part of the same thing? And are they perhaps related to dolphins or something like that? Um, Gilly, I really don't know, I'm afraid. I do know that rhino and elephant are very, 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 very distantly related. They're not closely related at all. I mean, they have the same strategy in terms of that grey skin. Yeah, no hair, but that's probably mainly because of their size. And as Steph was telling us today, uh, when we were standing next to the, the cars during the rain this morning, those rhinos are actually quite a modern design. It's not as old as we think it is. And I've certainly, when I was a, a new guide, used to tell people that it was an ancient design. They look prehistoric, but apparently they're not nearly as prehistoric as we perhaps thought they once were. In terms of their relationship to the cetaceans, cetaceans are the, are the mammals that live in the sea, are the dolphins and the whales. I, I think, mm, Gilly, I tend towards saying that they're not very closely, although they're definitely not very closely related, but I tend to say that they are very, very distant cousins indeed. I don't know if they're any closer related than we are, uh, but they might be. So if anybody has some information on that, please let us know. Wonderful question. Thank you, Gilly. I'm sorry I couldn't give you a more satisfactory answer about it. Brian, should we try up on the wall there? Let's just, we're going to try a little, see if we can move a bit. Unfortunately, often what happens with the signal is that if we move, it kind of bounces away and then you don't see us anymore and you can't hear us. So what we'll do is we'll just move very, very slowly around here and see if we can't see that other elephant. If the signal goes, Tara will tell me, she will instruct me vociferously to move back to where I'm supposed to be. Because <laughs> we, of course, can't tell where we are, whether the signal's working or not. And hello, little Brooklyn. Again, wonderful to have our young viewers with us. Brooklyn, and you want to know if elephants ever choke on branches?
Zeit für die Elephant Boy Scout. that we were when you had us before. Right, so that little experiment failed, I'm afraid. We went onto the dam wall, disappeared the signal, but at least you've still had wonderful visual of that beautiful elephant. And so I'm not sure how much of what I just said you got. So we went onto the dam wall, we came back here because the signal there was no good at all. And we're now watching that elephant going off to join his pal. Now we looked off the dam wall to the south to see if we could find his pal. We couldn't, we could just hear him feeding way off to the south. Now, I think what you'll find is that they're communicating with each other in a very subtle way. Now I'm sure you've heard many of us talking about how elephants are brilliant communicators, how they're able to communicate with what we call infrasound, which is a very low rumble, very infrasonic rumble. And what that means is that it's too low for us even to hear many times. So we hear apparently around 25 hertz is the lowest we're able to hear. And an elephant can rumble 
through its voice box at about 5 Hz. So that's extremely low and I think you'll find that these two old boys, or youngish boys, uh, young bachelors are talking to each other with those infrasonic rumbles. We also think it's possible that they can talk to each other through tectonic communication by stamping on the ground. They've got very sensitive feet and we think that they're able to hear or feel the sounds of other elephants moving, stamping their feet and perhaps communicate over huge distances of up to hmm, sort of 40 or 50 kilometers. Sometimes you hear stories of up to 600 kilometers, but I think those are fairly unsubstantiated. But certainly there are very many um, sensitive nerve endings in the bottom of an elephant's foot that helps it to feel uh, what's going on around it. Right, they have now disappeared, the elephants. So we're going to walk slowly back here. I think we'll pr you'll pr probably lose us, um, but we'll see what happens. And why are we doing that? Little Brooklyn, aged just 10 years, welcome. Very lovely to have you with us, aged just 10 years especially. Um, you want to know if elephants choke on the branches. Brooklyn, I don't think elephants choke. I think they're really good at chewing. Um, I'm sure that there's... You know, I think all mammals have got a a choke response, or most of us do. Now what choking is, of course, is something getting stuck and the windpipe is the pipe that goes into your lungs that allows you to breathe. And I think that all mammals have got that mechanism where the, uh, well, a lot of mammals, in fact, I, I know they don't all, all ma a lot of mammals have got the say that their mouth is connected to the windpipe and to the stomach pipe. And when the food goes down the wrong way, it's possible that they choke. Um, I don't know if an elephant can choke as such. I would suspect that they probably can, but only in extreme circumstances. Now, what is quite interesting, if you look at a zebra or a horse, they don't breathe through their mouths. They only breathe through their noses, which means that they don't choke. Um, they can, um, it was highly unlikely that they could choke. Uh, possible that they that they eat through, and so choking is much So an elephant can probably have a little bit of a choke, but I don't think, I don't think they choke too much. We're gonna just quickly nip down through here and back up to quarantine. Okay, let's go.
we've left the Juma waterhole now. The elephants have gone off to the south. Sorry, I'm Harry Pottering there with my stick. It's very difficult not to Harry Potter when you're carrying a stick. And we've headed back up towards quarantine clearings here and we'll see what we can find. Now, there have been some interesting little things that will come out after the rain, one of which are the millipedes, and we've seen two of them. Unfortunately, there wasn't any signal where we saw them. Two, and so I'm hoping we're going to find a few more here. Millipedes from an order called the Myriapoda, very ancient order of invertebrates. Now, people often talk about invertebrates and insects in the same kind of way, or arthropods. Now, invertebrates are anything that don't have a backbone. So, um, there are five classes of animals that have backbones. Those are the mammals, the fish, the amphibians, the reptiles, and the birds. Every other am animal, moving thing, is an invertebrate. And they have an exoskeleton. I'm just a bit of litter here that I'm going to pick up. Not sure where that came from. Oh. <laughs> it's the card game. Uh, I think it's a French card game and probably dropped by some French guests who are staying in camp at the moment. Uh, right, well, that's a bit odd to find up here. We're not far from camp, of course, so I'll put these in a, in a pocket and we'll walk along with them. Anyway, so everything else is an invertebrate, and what that means is that they don't have an internal skeleton, and I know for many of you this will be basically sort of um, third grade or fourth grade biology, but perhaps for the youngsters and for those who haven't or have forgotten their biology from school, uh, everything else is an invertebrate. So, there are lots of different kinds of invertebrates. Uh, one would be the myriapoda, which are the, those in, um, millipedes that we get here. Then you get the centipedes. Uh, there are lots and lots of different ones. The mollusks, which of course are the snails. The crustaceans, which would be crabs and lobsters. And then you get this enormous, enormous group all the insects and the insects have all got three legs and loads and loads by far the most invertebrates I think in the world are the insects and they would be flies and moths and butterflies and praying mantises and stick insects and beetles and mm, lace wings and dragonflies and all sorts of magnificent creatures and they find hundreds of new ones every year that no one's ever seen before. So when you get a, a book on insects, uh, they will always say something like, um, you know, in a bird book they'll give you up to the species, they'll give you exactly the bird and they know exactly how it behaves, where it lays its nests, where it's got its eggs, how many babies it makes. For insects, because there's so many hundreds and hundreds of thousands, we don't know, we know hardly anything about them. There are over 900 species of just dung beetles. Isn't that unbelievable? I'm not sure if you can hear, Brian, this is going to be quite a challenge. Some of my favorite summer... Oh dear, my shirt's coming off. That's going to frighten our younger viewers, possibly the older ones too. Um, there was a beautiful call, I'm not sure you heard, of the European bee eater, a gloriously golden-colored bird, or golden on the back, and they are my, one of my favorite summer sounds. They really mean that the summer's begun when they arrive back. So, I'm looking for a millipede as we walk along here. But while we're doing that, of course, the f one of the favorite things to look at on foot is... Dung. Dung. Here we go. Now, remember everybody, <coughs> dung, of course, is a fascinating thing because it tells us a huge amount about A, where the animal might be, and B, what it eats. And it also is very important for the animals because it, it, they use it um, to tell other animals where they are. So this here is the white dung of a hyena. And you'll notice a couple of little patches of white around here. I am allowed to point with my stick now because I'm pointing at something as opposed to waving it in your face. And there, this would be, have probably been an old hyena midden. And what that means is that it would have been like a territorial marking spot where the hyenas would have come and they would have all marked together. I don't see anything fresh here. Now the reason it's white, um, those of you who have got dogs and you've left your dog dung out for long enough, uh, which you shouldn't of course, uh, it will turn white eventually. 
Now the do this is this is not quite the same thing. It comes out a greenish colour and almost immediately turns this kind of chalky white, and that's because of the cal calcium, which comes out gre green and then it oxidizes in the sun and in the oxygen and it becomes white like this and that's what hyena dung looks like and it's very important for them when they're marking territory and that's how they mark the territory so all around the place we've got that one clan of hyenas Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, I was just saying the hyenas, big clan, and they've got little middens like this dotted about the whole border of where they live, and a few in the middle, but mainly on the outside. Then, of course, we have this delightful patty over here. Now, this delightful patty, Brian, I don't know if you can come a bit closer. There's quite a lot of interesting stuff going on. I've just put a thorn in my bottom. It's deeply painful. Ha! <laughs> yeah, okay, tight on the patty. Whew! Sorry everybody, big acacia thorn in the bum, deeply painful, might cry. <laughs> so this is a buffalo patty, and inside the buffalo patty, I'm going to return it to where it was, because this buffalo has created a little ecosystem just by going to the loo where he is here. Now remember, our younger viewers, and our older ones too, don't go fiddling with patties around your wilderness areas unless you know exactly what made them and if they could harm you or not. We know what this is, it's just digested grass, it's harmless. But beautiful inside here is a different kind of dung beetle. Now this dung beetle, I'm afraid, looks to be dead. So I'm very happily going to pick him up and I'll come and show him to you now. Unfortunately, he's dead, and I don't know why he's dead. Probably, I'll tell you why. It's probably a she. She's probably laid her eggs, and that's the end of her life cycle, so that's why she's died. So let me bring her over to you and attempt not to spike myself in the bottom again. In fact, it wasn't an acacia thorn. It was a devil key. I'll try and find it for you. It's a nasty, nasty little thing. Look at the beautiful color, iridescent green color of this dung beetle. It's still alive. It's still alive. Look at that. I'm going to put it straight back. I know exactly which hole it was in. So this is a dung beetle that doesn't roll dung, doesn't roll balls like the big ones that we often see here. What it does is that it digs down under the dung and lays its eggs under those little patties of dung. Also inside the dung there were a whole lot of ants and termites and different things like that. All right. So before we, we don't want to stress her too much. I'm going to put her back into the dung. Wouldn't she a beautiful colour? So we'll put her right back. Here's a little hole. Brian, I don't know if you can try and get this. You can actually see the hole that she's dug. She's gone straight back into her little hole. And there she'll lay her egg. So she digs that hole and then she'll take bits and pieces of dung from here, put it into the hole, lay her egg in the dung, probably climb out and go and do it again somewhere else. Otherwise, the youngsters, the, the larvae, which are, uh, I mean, in the same way that caterpillars turn into butterf butterflies and moths, so larvae of dung beetles, which are like little sort of um, white grubs or uh, wormy type things, so they turn into, they're the first life cycle stage of a dung beetle, and they will eventually turn into the beetle. So a whole little ecosystem here, created by the digestive sy system of one of Africa's great beasts, the buffalo. Now, I want to find this offensive thorn that has stuck me. I'll see if I can find it. And we are, we are fiddling around hyena dung, and Christine, you would like to know what would happen if a hyena were to come across us on foot. Um, I have seen hyenas many times on foot, Christine, and if, if, especially during the day, they are normally very nervous of us, as long as you're standing upright. They're actually one of the most, I mean, I say most dangerous, I mean most potentially dangerous animals, I can't find the thought. Um, most potentially dangerous an animals if you're camping. If you're camping, you have got to make sure in a wild area like this that you close your tent. 
and often it's very hot of course and so people sometimes who are inexperienced leave their tents open and then hyenas will come into tents and they can be very dangerous because you're lying down as soon as you stand up they run away so I've seen many many hyenas on foot and almost always they run away long before you get anywhere near them sometimes I've seen I had, did have one once just over there sort of on the on the cheetah cut line that um, kind of followed me and I was walking in one direction and he came around from the other direction and sort of stalked me a little bit and watched a bit until I shouted at him and then he, and he ran off. Some glorious light coming through the bush there. <laughs> and lots of queries about our safety today and the latest one from Gracie, age just eight, who says she worries about um, us very much. Um, Gracie, you worried about baboons and what they would do if we saw them. Uh, Gracie, baboons are very scared of people in wild areas like this. In areas like Cape Town where they've been fed by people, um, they do tend to be a lot more af uh, less afraid of people and they will come down and they'll, food, and they'll go into houses and steal uh, toiletries. I've seen them eating toothpaste before, which is quite funny to watch because they don't like toothpaste. They bite into it and then they spit it out and throw it away. But in this area, because it's a really wild area, baboons are very nervous of people and they wouldn't come anywhere near us. So don't worry, Gracie, we'll be okay. But thank you for your concern. Now this whole area, after the rain we've had today, I think is going to flush very nice green. All the green that you can see around you at the moment, very little of it is actually grass. Most of it is kind of little, um, those thorny things that stuck me in the bum. Uh, a whole lot of different kinds of herbaceous forbs, flowers and different pioneer forms of vegetation that grow in disturbed soils. And this is a disturbed site because it's an open area. It's one of the last areas to lose the grass to grazing. But there will be a huge seed stock of grass here. And now we've had some good rain. Hopefully those seeds will start to flush and we'll get a decent flush of good grass on the clearing here. Now look, if we dig here, you can get an idea of how much rain we've had. And we think, I haven't measured it actually, but we've had at least 20 millimeters in the last little while. And you can see, as I dig under the soil there, here's a piece of grass coming through as we speak, which is marvelous. Beautiful. Oh, and it's just so lovely feeling. This moist soil that's going to produce new life as the summer progresses. Ah, and here's something that was under the soil. This isn't what spiked me, but this can spike you quite nastily. And I think Brent showed it to you the other day. It's called a devil's thorn. And it's called a devil's thorn because normally it's got two thorns on it. And what it's a very clever, clever design. So it's got the two thorns, and what they do is they stick into the underside of animals. Is that right? Yeah, turn a little bit towards the camera. Yeah, there we go. right. Uh, they've got two thorns on the un underside like this, and what they'll do is they'll stick to animals' feet as they walk over them, and the animals will then sort of drag them along and probably sh be a little upset that they're stuck in the foot, and then eventually they'll shake them off, and that's where they'll decide to grow, because inside this seed pod is, of course, the seed. And they make lovely flowers, very beautiful pink flowers. So I'll put this back in, this, in the soil here. And if you were to dig around here in the soil, what you would find is a huge amount of um, different kinds of seeds growing, especially those kind of big devil thorns and lots of different uh, grasses. Right, let us head into the west, into the setting sun. So, Kay, you were asking about how much rain we've got, and I think it's about 20 millimeters. And along with the rain comes another query that I've been very worried about this year. And that surrounds the fate and existence and the whereabouts of the yellow weavers that we get here. Spotted-backed weavers and uh, southern masked weavers and probably lesser masked weavers as well. And 
I don't know where they are at the moment and uh, just often they do build around the water water places uh, you know around the water holes and B Wilson your your query about where they are um, is has left me flummoxed I don't know where they are I don't know why they aren't back yet and uh, I you know I've seen them I've seen them in Johannesburg and they they certainly don't have to wait for the rain in Johannesburg they start building their little nests in September already and I haven't seen one here yet so maybe it is the fact that we haven't had any good rain yet and maybe they're just a little bit later than they would be in normal uh, or normally or in other areas but certainly I'm a little bit worried by the fact that I have not seen one what is that running through there this is an impala whole lot of impala same herd I think that we saw earlier now there were reports of wild dogs around here earlier this morning now I don't know if you've ever seen wild dogs on foot but it is the most exciting thing they're the most exciting thing to see in a vehicle as well but wild dogs on foot are something special because they just ignore us completely so if they were hunting that herd of impala there they'd come streaming through here sort of they might give you a brief glance but they just carry on going and ignore you completely and if you can watch it in an area like this where it's open it's the most astonishing feeling of being close to the wild to watch any animal on the hunt of course but wild dogs on foot <laughs> what a thing to see let's just walk towards these impala and see if anything transpires there ah oh. I've had a brief query about termite mounds, so we'll head towards this not particularly amazing example. Ooh. Now, this query comes from Joyce in New Hampshire. And Joyce, you say you've seen lots of mounds and you've seen that lots of them have been abandoned. Um, Joyce? Some of them look abandoned and some of them aren't abandoned. This one, for example, I thought that I found an abandoned one yesterday, Joyce, and then Andrew said, no, no, hang on. Just feel above the thing. You can feel heat coming out of it. There's still heat coming out of this one. So I think this one is probably still occupied. Perhaps the colony is going through tough times. But you can see that there is no vegetation on it. And that normally means that there are termites resident within the mound. Now, also, there's a lot of dung from birds, probably hornbills. And I think what they do is that they, you know, they've been standing here picking out termites and they've left their dung here, which indicates to me that the mound is probably still active. Anyway, Joyce, you want to know why they would ever go inactive. Joyce, is, it's quite simple, really. Um, what happens is that when a termite, um, a termite mound begins, uh, and there'll be a whole lot more beginning fairly soon because the the um, the allate season or the flying ant season will start soon. And what happens is that the the king and queen come out of the mound, they go off, and then they land. And the female flutters her wings, and she sends out a pheromone, and then the male will find her. They'll shed their wings. Um, they will mm, consummate their marriage, and then they will dig down under the ground. And what happens then is that the, they female will start to grow from a tiny little thing about this big she will grow to almost half a foot she'll be 15 centimeters and then she'll start to lay eggs and she will lay 25,000 eggs a day by the end of her life she can last up to 15 years now if that egg production ceases so the mound will eventually become inactive she can be replaced she could be a mound might be she might just kind of um she might die off and the mound might become semi sort of abandoned and then maybe two new uh, termites might come and recolonize the mound you know they instead of digging their own they might land on an existing mound go down there find a decent spot inside there and start to lay eggs so basically if there's no queen inside the mound it's going to go inactive because eventually everyone will die there's only one breeding female and if she dies no one else is going to produce any eggs so that's how they become abandoned also they could be attacked by something like an artfark or an ant bear and the ant bear might come up and dig open and pull out the queen now if he gets to the royal chamber and he pulls out the queen 
again, the mound will die. Also, the other thing that does it is ants. One of the major killers of termites, believe it or not, is ants. And so they... We can just hear some impala grunting at each other. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Look at the sun there. So the ants will go in often when the termite mound's been opened up by something like an artefark or ant bear, the ants will get in there, they'll take away the youngsters, and that doesn't make a huge difference unless they kill the queen. So it's all about the queen, really, isn't it? and her ability to keep laying eggs. 25,000 every day, that's a lot of children. So all of the termites in the mound are in fact related to each other. They're all siblings. The queens and the soldiers, and not the queens, the, the workers and the soldiers are all siblings. It's an astonishing social arrangement of absolute cooperation, and I, I mean, it just really, I think, defies belief, to be honest. Then, Brian, we did, I did find a millipede, but I don't know that you're going to be able to see him or her. There's a millipede in that hole, which I'm not going to try and extract. Uh, I seriously doubt you're going to be able to see it. Can you see it in there? Vaguely. <laughs> there you go. You can just see the scales. Sort of, maybe not. <laughs> okay. There is... Oh, hang on. I'll put some light in there for you. Hang on, wait one second. I'll get some light in there. Oh, here we go. How's that? If we come over this side, you may well get him. No. I'm not getting any light in there. Oh, there we go. There we go. There's the millipede, everyone. Hooray! Great technology. Millipede. Now, millipedes, of course, apart from living in termite mounds for defense, um, have a lot of cyanide in their exoskeletons, and that makes them very distasteful. So they're often protected from things, except... Now, this is a mammal I've yet to see at Juma, and we see their tracks almost on a daily basis. They come out at night, and they're called civets, African civets. And they love millipedes, and they're middens. They leave these little middens called civet trees all over the place, and inside those civet trees or middens are the exoskeletons of a whole lot of millipedes. They're one of the only animals that will choose to eat millipedes. Let us... Let us examine what else we can find around here. And we'll probably keep walking till the sun goes down, which is not going to be in a very long time. Uh, we won't go to 7 o'clock, I don't think, because we're on foot, of course. And to be on foot in the dark out here is just a particularly silly idea. Hmm. Ah, now, one of my very favorite things to find in the early morning is a spider's web. And Mike in Florida, you have asked, will there be any yet? I think it was probably a bit windy today, Mike, for them to be out. Sorry, Ryan has just managed to hook himself there. Um, so, Mike, I don't think that there will be any particularly fresh ones, but I think as soon as it gets a little bit warmer, remember, these animals are, or the spiders are exothermic, so they do need the sun to stay warm, and then they will start to build. So I think as soon as the next kind of sunny patch comes along, we will have more spiders. And then around December, of course, we will get the golden orbweb spiders, which are just this stunning uh, orange and black and white and red and yellow, beautiful colored huge spiders that look terrifying but are completely harmless and Mike thank you you've reminded me that the Chinese basketball player is Yao Ming great work he's doing for rhino conservation do you smell it Brian these silver cluster leaf trees I got another whiff just now are starting to flower and I want to try and find you one that is actually in flower and for those of you who weren't with me on my last walk, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. I'm going to use my wand. These flowers smell like dirty feet. Ooh. Here we go. Have a sniff of that, everybody. Take a deep breath in. Mmm, not very delicious at all. Can you smell it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want a closer smell? 
Mm, yeah. And so now if we walk through a grove of these things, when they all come out, it smells like you're basically, you've been shrunken down and you're walking inside one of Brent Leo Smith's old boots. It's not a pleasant experience at all. Such beautiful trees with such incredibly foul smelling flowers. And I can think that, the, I can only think that that's because they're pollinated by some, probably some kind of carrying eating fly uh, that eats rotting meat or something like that, or maybe a moth that does the same thing. And the moths will be attracted by the smell. They'll come and they'll eat it, transfer pollen to the other ones, and so the silver cluster leaf trees will continue their lives. Let's wander down through here, Brian. There were some giraffe down here a little while back. Beautiful, look at this tree. Hey? This is a magnificent tree. And it's not an unusual tree, it's not a rare tree, it's just an astonishing, astonishing thing. This is Combritum collinum, or the variable bush willow. And look at this lovely little natural fort that it's made. As a child, I always loved to play in kind of trees like this, that provided natural forts. And as an adult, I really find it very difficult to walk past a tree like this and not climb into it and have a look what's going on. And it is so amazing, of course, because it's been pushed over and it's just turned 90 degrees and it's now growing the other way. Absolutely fine, living perfectly happily from Britum Kalinum. What a lovely atmosphere there is under this shade. This will be a good place on a hot day to come and sit. Mm. A great favourite of the elephants is Combritum collinum, especially during the early summer because it doesn't tend to have the same amount of tannins and uh, foul tasting substances in its leaves and its close relative Combritum apiculatum or the red bush willow. Here's another one. It's been pushed over. This is amazing. So these are roots, right? This is a root. This stopped being a root. As soon as it was exposed to the air, it stopped being a root and it turned into a branch. And it's now growing up and, as a trunk. Isn't that amazing? That's like your arm turning into a leg because you happen to be leaning the wrong way. That's really, that's what it is. Quite amazing. Hmm. And you don't tend to notice these things so much when you're not on foot. So we'll just do, we'll, we'll walk down towards the edge of the drain of the woodland there. And then we'll carry on around the side. Now, I tell you what, okay, we've had a, we've had a query from, we've had a query from Susie that she'd like to see a, a tortoise, a, a frog, or a snake. Um, Susie, I actually know where there was a frog yesterday, and I wonder if he is in the same place, just down here. We'll go and look for him, and while we're looking for him, we'll show you the clip of Andrew and my sighting of two beautiful leopard tortoises yesterday. So take a look at these and while you're doing that we'll head off to see if we can't find that frog just down here. Hello. Look at these marvellous little tortoises here that we have. Leopard tortoises. Uh, you can only see one at the moment. Beautiful little tortoise here. And in the most incredible detail, you can see the coloration and why they're called leopard tortoises now. Go on, move now. <laughs> Look at him, isn't he wonderful? And his little eyes blinking. And his, his uh, consort is heading off into some fairly thick bush. He looks like he might take a step forward now. And these guys are almost, they're totally vegetarian. They'll eat fresh grass if they can find it. And you can see he's got a little bit of his high tea still sticking out of his beaky little mouth. Wasn't 
weren't marvellous. Beautiful leopard tortoises, totally unexpected, just came walking across the road. Now, yesterday, Andrew and I also had in this very tree a painted reed frog, or what we think is a painted reed frog. I haven't found a picture of it, but I have seen evidence of them looking like that. It's kind of, it was a very uh, pale white colour with those l beautiful little golden stripes, only about that big, about mm, three quarters of an inch. And he was sitting in the leaves on this very tree. I don't see him here anymore. He's clearly moved on to warmer climes. Or because of the rain, perhaps gone in search of a, of a pan of water where he might be able to find a mate. It was the most beautiful little frog. And I can actually hear some frogs calling. And that's because of the rain. So there will be frogs out and about. So if we find one, Susie, I will do my level best to uh, show it to you. But this one has clearly migrated on from the silver cluster leaf tree. It could actually be here. I mean, they're so tiny, it could be here and just hiding from us. Anyway, let's just not dally here for too long. We'll carry on and see what else we can find here. Deb, Larry and Claire also worried perhaps about safety. Where on earth is Brent and where are the vehicles? Um, Brent is uh, taking a couple of well-earned days of rest. He has gone to meet his friend Jamie and they and two other friends have gone into the Kruger National Park and they're going to go and explore the wonders thereof for the next three or four days. The vehicles, um, well the vehicles are not too far away from being torched by me. Uh, they have decided to cease functioning, uh, and all three of them actually. Now we got on Wendy today, we fixed her brake line after breakfast today, uh, got on her, uh, turned the starter key and it went <laughs> and apparently it wasn't the battery, so something's wrong with Wendy. Jigger's in, still in hospital, having long-term uh, sort of a cosmetic surgery I suppose, and Rusty well, I think the little, the less said about Rusty, the better, probably. Now, she's just not functioning. So, at, for the moment, we're all on foot. Steph is around, so with any luck, you'll be able to have some conversations with him over the next little while, not just me. And that will be marvellous, because he is a font of marvellous knowledge, is our Steph. Now, this is a roundabout where they think the wild dogs came. So we're going to head into this area and see if we can't spot them. There's no danger attached to walking into wild dogs. There's no record, as far as I'm aware, of them attacking people. And once they see you and they relax, you can actually sit pretty close to them and they, they, don't, they don't tend to react. So it's really wonderful to spend a bit of time with some wild dogs, if we're lucky. If we are very lucky. So we've now moved off quarantine clearings and we're moving down west towards the drainage line and hoping against hope that we spot a dog or two or something else exciting. And you'll notice there's not a huge amount of game around at the moment and that's probably because of the weather so they do like, the animals do like to go into the kind of thickish bush where they can be sheltered from the wind especially after they've had quite a lot of rain on their skins. Just like us, if it gets windy while there's rain on our skins, they get very cold. You can hear a crested Franklin calling off to the side. Can you hear that, right? Not so much. Okay. I keep forgetting, of course, that the sound that you're getting is coming only through my, the microphone on my chest. There isn't a camera camera microphone. So we walk a little bit slower here because it's obviously a bit more closed so we need to be a lot more aware. And one of the things you've got to be aware for of course are buffalo. Now if you look over here a buffalo has rubbed his, the top of his itchy head against this flaky thorn tree 
Acacia exuvialis. There you can see it. And the buffalo has that's why you often see the top of a buffalo's horns is red. Because they come that redness is tannin. And the tannin in the bark is often used to tan leather. It has been used to tan leather, not so much anymore, but uh, it certainly used to be. And that's why a buffalo's horns are often red from this kind of rubbing. I think they get very itchy on the top of their heads. And I think possibly those horn moths, which uh, eventually eat away the keratin on the top of the uh, buffalo's horns when they die, I suspect that those horn moths might actually lay their eggs in the horn uh, before the buffalo dies and then they scratch them off. They probably get quite itchy and so they don't actually ever develop on a living buffalo. Right, let us walk through here. With any luck you're still receiving us relatively loud and clear. That's wonderful, we've got firm signal. Now, while we're walking through here, looking for the great predator that is the wild dog, and my goodness, it would be wonderful to see them. Um, Mike, you have asked a very poignant question, to which I think you're going to find the answer surprising. We have seen the Inkahuma pride of late, five lionesses now. Now, when I started here, there were eight of them, and the young male junior, who has either been chased off, possibly killed, I hope not, or he's just decided to press on and because of the pressures from the males. Now, he was about three and a half years old, so it was definitely time for him to leave home. And Mike, you want to know with the changes of dynamic, the three lionesses, and of course that young male, uh, how will things change for the pride now that they don't have numbers on their side? You'll find, Mike, that things will probably change for the better. And Brian, are we will be right down here. Um, I asked Brian that, everyone, because he, Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll reverse. We were losing signal. We'll just we'll walk along the fringe of the drainage line here. Let's go down this way, Brian. I think it'll, it'll probably be okay there. Um, Mike, you'll be surprised to hear that a, a pride of five lionesses is probably better off than a pride of say. Um, Definitely better off than a pride of five lionesses with a young male. And that's simply because the young male is able to dominate kills. And so while he does help out with some of the killing, um, he does dominate the kills completely because he's stronger and bigger. And so he will take more meat than his necessarily his due. So they'll actually eat more as five lionesses without the male. Without those other females, yeah, they just they just kill smaller prey. I don't think that they'll be um, necessarily adversely affected at all. Remember that a single lioness on her own is as successful as two lionesses. In fact, more successful than two lionesses. As successful in terms of the amount that they eat as three lionesses. And four or five lionesses tends to be the optimum kind of a m number that you want out here. So I think that they're probably slightly better off than they were when I first met them in May. So I hope that's a, a surprisingly positive answer that has uh, resulted from a... Dogs. Did you hear that? Mm. Let's walk. Come. It's either dogs or a hyena. It was a loud whooping call. Woo! That's really exciting. <laughs> quite far away, so we'll walk, mm, we don't, I mean we can't go charging through here because it's quite thick. Loud whooping sound, which I don't think you picked up. <laughs> go away. exciting.
Have you still got us? Oh, sorry everybody. I thought you'd lost us for a second there, but you're still with us. We're going to walk straight through here. There's a termite mound there. We're going to climb onto the top of the termite mound and we'll look down and see if we can't hear what made that whooping noise. I'm pretty sure it was a dog. Either that or something being uh, murdered. But it sounded like a dog making their whooping contact call. Oh. Now, of course, you can't just hair off through the bush because there could be anything anywhere. There could be buffalo here, there could be elephants lying around. So you've got to be, well, they won't be lying around, they could be walking around. So you've got to keep looking. So Susie, you reckon you heard a noise and it sounded like a hyena. It did sound a little bit like a hyena, but it sounded too whoopy to me. It sounded like a, um, it's just a different tone. And the microphone that I've got on my chest here, unfortunately, is not going to pick up the best sound for you where you are. All right, so we'll get up onto this termite mound here and see if we can't hear something further. You're right there, Brian. <laughs> Brian's carrying a huge pack on his back. So exciting. The frogs are calling all the way around us now. Now, if those are dogs on the hunt, of course, you know, I mean, we'd never catch them on foot unless we were champion marathon runners. And uh, with all the camera paraphernalia, I don't think we are possibly marathon runners at the moment. Always a good idea to smell, of course, because dogs do smell very powerfully. Hmm. I'll tell you what, Brian, there's an old road that runs through this block in front of us here, round about where I thought I heard them. Did, did you also think that you heard the mm. sound from there? Yeah. So we'll go through here and then we'll walk up the old road back towards quarantine clearings because if they haven't killed, if it is dogs and they haven't killed, that clearing's where they're going to go. Let's go down here. Let's quickly check the wind. It's still blowing from the southeast at the moment, but it is swirling. And we're going to listen quite carefully here because if they have caught something, they'll make that twittering noise. So exciting. Oh, it would make me extremely happy to see them on foot. Also, just keep an eye on the Juma Dam Cam. If they are on the hunt, they may well pitch up down there looking for something to eat and then make their way onto quarantine clearings. Elephants moving way off behind me there, but no dogs. Okay, let's go up this way. Let's go towards the clearing. Check for tracks, but in this light, the, our best bet for sort of finding them would probably be our noses because they smell so powerful um, and seeing tracks in this kind of terrain is really difficult so the best bet would be to get some kind of a sense of them from the smell and for those of you who don't know wild dogs smell like wet dogs really strong and grubby wet dogs and it seems to be an offensive smell at home but it's not an offensive smell 
out here it's the most exciting smell you can smell so we're on an old road here you can see that it's a bit of a depression either that or an old boundary I'm not sure what it is Watch out, Brian. Just got to move the trees for the big aerial. So we are moving at quite a speed now, so your picture might be a little bit jerky, but that's because we're on the hunt. Imagine how fast it must be for wild dogs. A very brief, a very brief digression here for what is an artfark hole, and it's a it's a different kind of termite that this aardvark's been after. This is here; it's called odontotermes, not the fungus growing. Well, it is a fungus growing termite, but not that. They're not big mound builders, but lots of termites under the ground there that the artfark has taken. Right. Let's move a little bit further. I haven't heard anything else, so maybe they went running straight through here. But I think we'd smell them if they came exactly where we are. And apparently, Lynn, you can hear a squirrel alarm calling at the Juma Dam Cam. So if you are a zoomy and you're watching, um, if you could zoom all the way up and get as wide out as you can, that would be wonderful. I obviously don't know what you're looking at, but just get as wide out as you can and you might be lucky. Just stop and listen. thought I heard another whoop maybe in the distance. It was a bird. Let's carry on. Ow. In the leg. It's alright. What we're going to do everyone, um, it's now starting to get a little dark, so we're going to head back across to where our vehicle is, the Mahindra, ever reliable car. We're going to head across to there and we'll just do it slowly now. I can't hear Impala alarm calling, but because it's getting dark we can't be on foot for much longer. So we're going to just head down there, probably about another 15 minutes or so, and then we're going to call it quits for the day. And for those of you who have just joined us, just to let you know, um, we're having a few vehicle troubles, so that's why we've been on foot the whole day today and why we've been around this sort of vicinity because um, signal-wise it's a little difficult to move much with a walking backpack. But that's okay. Quarantine clearings is obviously one of, if not the most beautiful part of what is a very beautiful little reserve. So we'll just keep a beady eye out in front of us See if there aren't any impala herring across the place. Keep looking behind us. It's important to maintain 360 degree awareness. But at the moment I don't see anything other than a very leaden but beautiful sky. Now those clouds have done a fairly typical October thing. They build and it always looks like they're building up all the way around you. It always feels like we're always the only ones that don't have the clouds above them. I'm sure that's just a sort of error of the mind because of where they're, they're all billowing out of the sky. But if we look off to the south there, there's an enormous bank of gorgeous, gorgeous grey clouds. Oh, that's wonderful. 
Hmm. Just stunning. You might even be able to see them moving. And you just don't get this kind of impression when you're in a car. I'm hoping we'll get a bit more rain tonight, I must say. So those impala that we saw earlier were just across there. They don't seem to be there anymore, but that's not necessarily an indicative of anything too drastic. Let's have, one, let's have a look one more thing. There's an Egyptian goose here, there's a couple of them. They're normally algae eaters, so I'm not sure what they're doing up here. There's a little pair of Egyptian gooses standing on quarantine clearings, like two impala, waiting for the night to come. There they are. <laughs> they always look so imperious and yet so unimperious at the same time. It's like they want to be imperious, but they just don't really quite get there. That's the male to the right and the female to the left. You can see he's a little bit bigger than she is and he's got a bit more in the way of um, pharaoh-like markings. That's why, where they get their name from. It's a stretch, I know, but that is where the name comes from. Right. Um, I think on the note of these uh, Egyptian geese, given that we are about to walk across to the vehicle, this might be a good place to stop. So thank you very much for being with us. Sorry about the sort of um, lack of a vehicle. We're going to do our level best to have Wendy up and running by tomorrow morning. If she isn't, I'm afraid it's going to be one of us on foot again for well, as long as we, you will tolerate us, basically. Um, wonderful questions again. So enjoyable to have this kind of... Um, well, it's great to chase wild dogs on in the car and see leopards and lions, but great to have a kind of intimate wilderness experience and conversation with you at the same time. So thanks very much for your questions and your comments. Thank you, Brian, on camera, for your pack mule efforts, and to Tara and Louise, of course, in the final control. We'll see if uh, Steph has managed to bash Wendy into any kind of working order uh, by this time tomorrow. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe and stay happy. We'll see you at Hot Boss 5 tomorrow in what will hopefully be a beautiful African dawn. Whether it will be a bright one or not, I'm not sure, but we'll see you then. Bye-bye.